You are listening to Mining Stock Education, where you'll learn from the top leaders in the natural resource sector and uncover quality mining investment opportunities. Take a look at the history of gold. You shouldn't be building a mine for anything above eleven or twelve hundred dollars an ounce, all in sustaining costs, because it'll come back to haunt you. Uh, gold will be volatile; could easily go to three thousand dollars within a year. Could it easily go back to a thousand dollars? Thanks for tuning in to Mining Stock Education. I'm your host, Bill Powers. And in today's episode, you're in for a treat. You're going to be hearing from Steve Letwin. He is the just retired CEO of I Am Gold. I Am Gold has about, in 2020, about a billion dollars cash on hand, and they produced a little over 650,000 ounces of gold. So it's a mid-tier progressing towards becoming a major, and Steve was at the helm for 10 years. So I asked him to come on the show today to talk to us about what we should look for in a gold producing investment. Steve also has a lot of experience uh, in the oil industry. In fact, he's currently working again in the oil industry. So I'm gonna ask some questions, how the oil industry as gold investors, what we could learn from some of the cyclicality and things in the oil industry. And I would like to thank Tony Moreau, who is the new CEO of American Eagle Gold. He used to work for Steve at I Am Gold, and that was the introduction of how I got to meet Steve. So go check out American Eagle Gold. The website is AmericanEagleGold.ca. It's part of the Ore Group, which is a sponsor of Mining Stock Education. And this is soon to be IPOing, and their Golden Trend project, which they'll be exploring, is on the Cortez Trend, right next to Nevada Gold Mines, a huge huge mines. There are tens of millions of ounces. Again, AmericanEagleGold.ca. So Steve, welcome onto the show. And as I mentioned, you you. have experience in the oil industry. So as gold investors, what would be some key things that we could learn from the oil industry? Is there any instructive points that the energy sector could teach the gold sector? Well, thank you, Bill, for having me. And I want to thank Tony for uh, suggesting my name. Tony's a fantastic individual, great, great new CEO uh, at American Eagle. So I know that's that company is going to do very well. Um, there's, there are very, very many uh, comparisons. In fact, you know, because it's a commodity and it's subject to what I would call, you know, a high degree of volatility, the cost element of, of both oil and gold is absolutely critical. And so there tends to be, Bill, and you would know this, you know, in an environment where you see prices move up precipitously, there's a tendency to see cost structures move in tandem. And then when uh, the commodity falls, uh, many, many producers, whether it's oil and gas or whether it's gold or silver, can get caught quite quickly uh, because it's much uh, more difficult to bring cost structure down on a timely basis than it is to uh, to see the prices go up and down. So prices are driven by market, cost structures are driven by the internal politics of a company. And I, and the biggest lesson I learned in oil and gas was never, never, never uh, let your cost structure uh, get out of control. And it's the same thing uh, that I would say about the gold business. When I went into the gold business in 2011, Gold was going from around $1,200 an ounce up towards uh, $2,000 an ounce. And the biggest challenge I had was, and you know, I'm pointing at myself here as well as, as the industry, is that that cost structure just literally got out of control. And uh, 2014, 2013, um, we really had to take action. And I give the board of directors of buying gold full credit and the management team because we were first to take action in the industry. Uh, We had the highest costs, so we had to be the first movers. We cut capital, we cut costs dramatically to get margins back in line. So a lot of similarities there, Bill. It's often said, Steve, that the one thing we learn from human history is that we don't learn anything. So as (laughs) as it relates to the gold cycle, are the executives gonna make the same mistakes as gold continues to rise higher here? You know, I'm going to say no. I'm going to say um, that the, the gold CEOs, um, and they're, they're just a, a whole plethora of great CEOs in the industry, 
I think the gold CEOs did learn a very serious lesson and they're very cognizant of cost structure. And I'm going to give them, I'm going to give them the benefit of the doubt. I know certainly at I'm Gold, Gord Stoddard, the new CEO, who's, who's a great guy, great leader. Don Charter, who's the chairman of the board of directors. Again, another great leader. These guys have been to what I call the Vietnam of, uh, of gold uh, uh, costs. And I don't think they want to go back there. And I, in the oil industry, you're seeing the same thing. In fact, you're seeing massive consolidation in the oil business to address cost structures and margins. And I think you're going to see that in the gold space as well as time goes on. So do you think there needs to be a lot more consolidation specifically with the mid-tier gold producers right now? I, I, I always have believed that. I guess I, I'm a Mark Bristol fan. And uh, I think the world of him is a, is a gold leader as well. And he certainly points to that. I say that for a couple of reasons. One, you've got reserves depleting at a much more rapid rate than you have uh, production. So production is, is uh, we're probably depleting, I would say, somewhere around 20% a year. So at 110 million ounces a year of production, you sure as heck are not finding 110 million ounces of gold. That's not happening. So you're seeing reserves that many of these companies get depleted. And gold reserves usually run, I would say, eight to 10 years. So you've got a lot of replacing to do, or you run out of gold, quote unquote. So, and it's getting more and more difficult to find, just like oil and gas in Western Canada, because uh, a lot of the big deposits have been found. And most of the new deposits happen to be in areas that are less friendly, and more risky. So I think you're going to see, Bill, more consolidation in the gold space, and you're going to see more consolidation in the oil and gas space. Just saw ARC Resources uh, get together with 7 Gen um, to form a big company. You saw the Huskies and Olus move in the oil and gas. You're going to see more and more of this. Um, and, you know, there was a rumor Barrick was talking to Newmont again. There was a rumor, of, you know, about a lot of companies. Uh, in the space uh, chatting. You just saw Endeavor and Taranga get together, West Africa focused. So yes, I do believe you're going to see further consolidation, mainly because A, you're, you're battling re, uh, reserve depletion and you're always battling cost escalation. Over the last year, when you look at all the different transactions that took place regarding M&A, what was the best one? What stands out in your mind? I think the deal that uh, Bristol orchestrated uh, with John Thornton, the Barrick Rand Gold uh, combination, which was done in market, was brilliant. It was brilliant and uh, much needed. It was a it was a catalyst bill for uh, other companies to look at it and say, "All right, thirty percent premiums don't seem to work." The investors really don't like to see that kind of uh, premium in the market. So when they did mar uh, uh, you know, zero premium merger, um, it, at first people thought that was not a good thing, or some at least. I always viewed it as very positive. And look at the results. I mean, very, very positive results from those two companies getting together. And I, I do think you're going to see more of that going forward. Um, because it's very difficult, I think, for a lot of companies, at least two big companies, to defend 30% premiums. Um, you know, it takes a long time to earn that back. Um, and especially if you've done it in a high price environment, it gets doubly uh, difficult. Steve, we touched on the different excesses or mistakes that executives can often make at a cyclical peak. Um, it was interesting that you said you expect perhaps not as many of those will happen, but what needs to take place within a company or within the industry so that the excesses of 2012 don't occur again? The biggest challenge they're going to have is actually related, I think, to the ESG element. And part of that is going to be governments who are struggling with the pandemic bill uh, and incurring big deficits. Um, I always say when I landed in some of these countries, uh, there was at least one handout uh, looking for, for, for something. I would tell you that there are gonna be two hands out. So uh, 
you know, whether it's Canada, um, whether it's the U.S., whether it's a West African country or a South American country, I'm not, I'm not saying there are biases here, but obviously countries that are in more dire straits economically, when they see $1,800 gold prices and they look at how much they're getting in terms of royalties, I guarantee you they're going to be knocking on the door of these gold CEOs saying, uh, you know, it's going to be like the old uh, uh, movie, you know, please, sir, can I have more? And uh, that's just one thing that's going to happen here. Uh, so gold CEOs are going to have to use their corporate affairs teams or government relation teams to work very hard and diligently with these countries uh, to try and minimize that because, Again, uh, there are going to be a lot of people looking for uh, financial help. And then on the labor side, you're always going to get people when you see $1,800 gold and margins running around, you know, $700, $800 an ounce, you're going to get underground miners and open pin miners who are going to say, hey, hang on a second, I want a share of that. And, you need, you know, we've been, we've been down in the dumps here for 10 years and you've suppressed wage increases Now's my turn, you know, time to share some of that cash. That's where you're going to have a lot of the pressures. And with the pandemic out there, you've probably got supply pressures coming with materials, et cetera. So you add all that up, uh, CEOs and, uh, and the management teams of these various companies are really going to have to be diligent, vigilant about uh, keeping a, a lid on those costs. You brought up a lot of issues there. As a gold CEO, you have to deal with expectation and desires of government, of labor, of uh, local leaders. You have to deal with uh, investors. So how do you balance all of that? How do you balance specifically what's best for the long term of the company with the short term desires of what investors are telling you they want to see? That's a tough balance. And, um, you know, you know and, and what I found is that... Um, you really, really have to spend time at the site. In, in the gold business, in the oil and gas business, everything is local. So what works in Suriname in South America may not work in uh, Burkina Faso in West Africa. So relationship building is everything. And it doesn't matter um, you know, whether what business you're in. If you don't do that properly, then... You know, it's not going to work. I made 54 trips to Burkina Faso in 10 years. Um, I made, I think, somewhere around 60 trips to Suriname. And I think 90% of those trips were tied into not only the mine itself, but to the community and the government. And that relationship means a huge amount. So these CEOs have a lot of balancing to do. But the one thing they need to do, and most of them do this because they're very active CEOs. I know Gord Stoddard, <clears throat> you know, is, is very active this way. You've got to be at the site. You've got to deal with the community. You've got to talk to the workers. You've got to educate them. And, and you've got to let people know that if we go crazy with cost increases, we're all going to pay for it again. Because the gold price, as we have seen, is very volatile. And uh, what, three months ago, it was at $2,000. It's down 10%. That's a lot. And, uh, you know, who knows where it's going to go? I happen to think it's going to go up versus down. But no one can tell what the future is for gold prices. So you really can't make these short-term decisions around wages uh, government takes community handouts, and handouts is probably a bad word. Community sharing is a better word. Um, you really just can't, you can't do that uh, until you get a much stabler view of where the prices are going to be. Fury Gold Mines is a Canada focused exploration and development company committed to aggressively growing its scalable, high grade gold assets with major drill campaigns planned across its 3.5 million ounce portfolio. Fury is led by a management team of proven explorers and developers with a track record of success in advancing and financing project development. Fury Gold Mines is well positioned to create value for investors with low risk development growth and the potential for a new major discovery. Fury Gold Mines trades on the TSX and NYSE American under the ticker F-U-R-Y. 
To learn more, go to furygoldmines.com. That's furygoldmines.com. Considering you're now retired as the CEO of I Am Gold, perhaps you have a little, can be a little more candid at answering this question, but what perhaps frustrated you the most or what misconceptions did you see with investors regarding their expectations of you as a CEO of a gold producer? Uh, schizophrenia would be a word that I would use. And I, I'm not being hopefully overly critical. Um, when I joined the company, there was a I, when I joined the company, there was a big emphasis on what I call long cycle economics. So capital was king. Um, they, the the concern was reserves, um, exploration uh, programs that were fairly robust, etc. So gold prices are moving up at an exponential rate. Uh, every discussion I had. Uh, at the various conferences tied to long cycle economics. As soon as the gold price started to move down, uh, that was thrown out the window. So I'll, I'll give you a quick example. We sold the deposit, Tarqua Domingue in uh, West Africa in uh, DRC and we sold it to Goldfields and we netted uh, 667 million after tax on this sale. And it was a phenomenal deal for I'm Gold shareholders. Good deal for Nick Holland at, uh, at uh, you know, Goldfields at the time. But I got massacred by investors who said, what are you doing selling ounces? We had an 18% interest. Cost structure was going to go through the roof. Reserves were challenged. And this was like a 37% IRR. Not joking. And they were angry with me. They said, you should not be selling ounces. Two years later, they said, that was the best deal of, the, of your career. <laughs> <laughs> and it was, by the way. So they, they moved from long cycle economics to short cycle economics. What do I mean by short cycle economics? Something that's gonna throw off cash flow fairly quickly, less than a three year payback on investment, and they wanted, wanted to see a self-funding model where you're not coming to the investor for equity uh, to build projects. You're going to use your ca excess cash flow to keep the business sustained or grow the business. So they moved from, please come to the market, $8 billion worth of equity financing in 2011 to $2 billion of equity financing on a good day in 2016. So you saw this transition from give me the long cycle to short cycle. And you may see people go back a little bit to long cycle here simply because they can see the fact that capital has been uh, really scarce and reduced in terms of reinvesting. You see that in the oil and gas space as well. So they may come back a little bit, but I think they're going to stay in the short cycle frame of mind for, for some time here. Steve, you grew I Am Gold significantly over your decade there. So if there was a management team that is bringing online their first gold producing asset and they come to you for advice, what would be your key advice for them as they're coming to you asking, how do we grow this company into a multi-asset producing gold company? I would tell them um, that you've got to have proof of concept. And what do I mean by that? I think, you know, and I'll use, I'm, I'm involved with a junior company called Cassio Gold. It's uh, gldc.v on the uh, venture exchange. It has about a million ounces of inferred resource. It's run by a fellow uh, great guy, young guy, Marco Rock, um, has a great, great team. And what you need to do, Bill, is show investors the path from where you are today to an NPV, a net present value that makes sense. And if you're able to prove that up and move that into commercial production um, in line with what you've told investors and prove that, prove to them that you can execute, then you can take the next step, whether it be another deposit or an acquisition. 
But investors have become very, call it um, skeptical of companies and CEOs who do the talk, do the promotion, and really don't deliver. So I would say step at a time, deliver what you say you're going to deliver, even better, uh, under promise, over deliver, get that in your genes, and then move on. And that's the approach we're taking at Cassiar. Let's move this deposit ahead. We think there's anywhere from three to five million ounces there. Tony Moreau is going to need to do that at American Eagle. Um, but proof of concept is everything, uh, no matter what business that you're in. And investors want to see that. Now, in today's crazy world where you know, you see stocks moving up 300% in a month with nothing. I think that's uh, that's going to have a bad ending for a lot of people. And people will come back to value stocks where there's a proof of concept in place. What are your thoughts about growing a gold producer utilizing debt in today's gold environment? Well, at low, low interest rates, some level of debt for any capital structure makes good sense. But, you know, I started my career in oil and gas at Dome Petroleum. Jack Gallagher, who, you know, I loved him. He was my boss for a while. I was his assistant back in the Dome Petroleum days. And, uh, you know, he used debt to finance too many things. And even on his deathbed said to me, you know, the biggest lesson he learned was, don't fall in love with your equity. Don't drink your own whiskey to the point where equity, you think your equity is always undervalued and you don't use it to finance operations that you want to grow operations or acquisitions. Equity has got to be in the equation or you will pay for that. Um, debt levels, you know, my son got a mortgage in, in uh, Los Angeles. He's 30 years old. He just bought a million dollar condo. Uh, and he got a 30-year mortgage rate of 2.5%. You know, that that's very attractive. Uh, oh, gold companies can probably get equity or debt today, probably on long-term debt in the even high yield market at less than 7%, 6%. Um, that's attractive and that is compelling. But again, I would highly recommend that you've got a good balance between equity and debt because you will pay for that over time. Both as a personal investor and as a gold producing executive, just give us a little uh, profile or describe to us what is the ideal gold development project that you would invest in? Number one would be jurisdiction. Make sure that it's friendly, has a history of uh, not uh, reneging on contracts or agreements. So the country of investment, the region, is number one. As uh, you do not want to be sitting there three, four years into development and find out that the country is going to be nationalizing any part of your investment, changing the tax regime or the royalty regime. We've seen examples of that most recently. That's number one. Number two is to make sure the community surrounding your investment is on side. That comes back to local politics. First Nations in Canada or the U.S., uh, community people that live in these countries uh, that are in the villages have to be on side and have to be supported. That would be number two. Uh, number three is infrastructure. Make sure that the cost of the infrastructure surrounding the mine doesn't trump the amount of money you need to build a deposit. So power lines, roads, airports, access to labor, all of those are critical in the development of a mine. And if you don't have that and have to spend hundreds of millions of dollars building a road or building power lines uh, or transporting people to the site, that can eat your lunch very, very quickly. And then I would just say the last and final one would be uh, making sure your investors um, are well-educated and well-informed about where you're going to go and are supportive. So, you know, doing your presentations in, adva in advance to make sure your key investors are on side and supportive is also critical because you don't want them 
getting a third of the way or a quarter of the way into the project and then saying, wait a minute now, we're pulling out of here. So that would be a quick summary of what I'd recommend. And is there a minimum size deposit that you would look for? We've always set an iron goal that it has to be at least a million ounces. Uh, that may be higher now. I mean, that would be at 100,000 ounces a year, you know, 10-year mine life. Uh, that may be a bit small today. You may need closer to 2 million ounces, just given the volatility of gold. I saw some really crazy things happen where, you know, people went out and started the development of a mine when gold was at $1,800. And then all of a sudden, as they're getting through to development, price falls down to $1,100. And all of their economics were built around, call it $1,500, $1,600. I, I, and I follow, again, I follow the, the view that uh, take a look at the history of gold, and you shouldn't be building a mine for anything above $1,100 or $1,200 an ounce, all in sustaining costs, because it'll come back to haunt you. Uh, gold will be volatile. It could easily go to $3,000 within a year. Could it easily go back to $1,000? You simply don't know. So make sure when you're building that mine that it can get through the tough years and it's sustainable. And you can harvest when it's at 3000 You can hunker down, but not go under when it's 1000 yeah, that, that's key advice. So a lot of people invest for these leverage plays on a rising price of gold, but you're saying be conservative and preserve capital, right? Absolutely. So you work in the oil and gas space right now. Give us your outlook for the oil and gas uh, sector and where are you seeing opportunities? I, I'm optimistic about oil and gas because, uh, again, because the amount of capital that's been reinvested in the business over the last three or four years has been uh, severely reduced. And again, we're producing, I've been around numbers here, 100 million barrels a day. We simply aren't reinvesting enough money to replace that. Now, people would argue there are lots of reserves in Saudi Arabia, there's lots of reserves around the world, um, but those reserves are costing more money to access. And so I think what you're seeing today, Bill, you know, with almost $60 WTI, during a pandemic. And, you know, yesterday we saw $7 US and MMBTU on gas because it's been so cold. Um, I am optimistic that prices are going to stay, you know, fairly robust. And you have heard people say maybe we're going to see another super cycle um, out there for commodities. I don't know what that means in terms of uh, WTI. I don't think you're going to see $100 WTI. But I do think you're going to see somewhere between $60 and $70 WTI. Uh, that may mean the Permian comes back. That may mean fractionators come back. That may be mean some of the offshore projects go ahead. But uh, we would need $60 to $70 to get those projects moving ahead. So I'm pretty optimistic. And on natural gas, um, you know, we're, we're seeing the same thing. So I think it might be a reasonably good time and margins are improving. You saw in the energy space, stocks have moved up quite a bit. We don't want to make this mistake of throwing a bunch of capital at it again. I don't think investors are going to tolerate that, especially with the ESG umbrella hanging over top, environmentalists, uh, trying to, uh, really suppress any further development in the hydrocarbon world. But uh, these electric vehicles, I think there's been a uh, overestimation of how quickly they can be produced, uh, battery production, battery uh, sustainability. And by the way, last time I looked, all of these cars and batteries need metals. And uh, in order to produce them, you've got to mine. So, uh, hydrocarbons, I think, might be around a little longer than what people think, and uh, we could see demand outpace supply simply because of the capital uh, preservation that's been going on in the space. Thank you for your insight, Steve. And before you go, uh, let people know where you're working now. Could you share your information and website? I, I work for a wonderful family called the Mannix family, Fred Mannix. Um, it's an uh, office here in uh, Calgary. So 
going back here with uh, my two daughters and grandkids. Uh, it's uh, good to be back other than this minus 40 degree weather that we have. But um, Fred Mannix and his family go back over 100 years in Western Canada. He's a big believer in creating jobs. Uh, he's a true patriot. He's a, he's a great Canadian. I love the guy. He's, uh, he's somebody I really look up to. I've been involved with him now for 23 years. Uh, changed my life uh, in many respects. Um, and in the family, the, the, his wife, Leanne, uh, his children are just uh, salt of the earth. Great, great people. They've got a great board. He runs his private company like a public company. And uh, with all the governance, um, Elizabeth Cannon, Dr. Elizabeth Cannon from the University of Calgary, just became our new chairman yesterday. Um, so it's a great organization. As I say, about 60 people here. We're in real estate, oil and gas. Uh, we have a portfolio uh, that uh, you know we use for, for market trading purposes. We're in the coal business. We're in what we call corporate ventures. So we're investing small companies, a lot of them in Canada, to try and build companies and build jobs. So I'm at the helm and uh, it's, it's good to be here. Thank you for sharing your insights on today's show, Steve. I look forward to speaking with you again sometime. Thank you, Bill. It's a pleasure.